23 through 28. I invite you to hear these words. I will sanctify my great name which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when through you I display my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you. You shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. Then you shall live in the land that I gave to your ancestors, and you shall be my people and I will be your God. This is God's word for us this morning. The founder of Methodism was John Wesley. John Wesley was an Anglican minister, but even after he entered the ministry, he felt like there was something still missing from his heart and life. And he describes an incident that took place on May the 24th, 1738, He says he went very reluctantly to a prayer meeting that was being held on Aldersgate Street in London. And he said that about a quarter before nine, as the man who was reading describing the change that God works in the heart through Christ, Wesley said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. And I felt that I did trust in Christ, in Christ alone for my salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away all of my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Some of you are familiar with this testimony of John Wesley where his heart was strangely warmed. And ever since that time, as he founded the Methodist movement, Methodism has been known as a people of the warm heart that we believe and proclaim a Savior who still to this day transforms hearts and transforms lives. To this day, through Jesus Christ, God redesigns our inner space just as he redesigned John Wesley's inner space back in that day. The prophet Ezekiel, he really describes this transformation. What takes place? What happens when we offer our lives to Christ Jesus and allow him to redesign our inner space? Well, first of all, removal. That's the first thing that happens. Did you hear the prophet say? God says, I will remove your heart of stone. God, when we turn our lives over to him, he begins the process of taking away from us that which does not belong in our lives. That's the removal. The heart of stone is taken out, he says. Through Jesus Christ, God is able. Yes, things in our lives that we sometimes don't even want to acknowledge, but we know that are there. There's only one person who can take care of those items, and that is God in Jesus Christ. Marty Sheffield writes that when she received her degree in interior design, She couldn't wait to try out all of her skills and abilities and everything that she had learned. So who better to try it out on than her own parents? And so her parents agreed to let her redesign their living space and their dining room area that was sort of all one space. But her dad put one condition on it. He said, honey, I'll let you redesign this living room and so forth, but don't move my favorite chair. His favorite chair, like many of us have, was an old beat-up recliner. The fabric was out of date and worn. It was stained with foods, and Marty Sheffield says on a hot day, it even smelled. (laughs) And so she did. She redesigned it all. Beautiful. Took a number of weeks. And she followed her father's orders. The chair was still there. So she did her day of big reveal to her parents. And they came walking in and saw this magnificent and gloriously transformed room with the chair. And she said it didn't take very long as they gazed in wonder at what she had done. And she was very pleased that they liked it. 
It didn't take very long. She says to her, Dad said to her, Well, honey, it's kind of obvious. This chair doesn't belong here, does it? This chair doesn't belong here. And he was right. Now, it took the beauty and wonder and redesign all around him for him to finally realize that the chair didn't belong, but he came to that awareness. And I say unto you, friends, when it comes to God removing from our hearts and lives what doesn't belong, it's not an easy journey, but when we give ourselves to Jesus Christ, he shows us what doesn't belong. We come to an awareness ourselves of, of a sin in our life or of a burden in our life. We come to an awareness that that anger doesn't belong there anymore. That bitterness does not belong there anymore. That prejudice does not belong there anymore. I may have enjoyed the comfort of that favorite chair stuck in my old ways and old attitudes. But when you encounter the Savior of the world, you realize, Lord... That just doesn't belong in the space that you occupy, does it? And then he gives us the strength to continue to move toward the changes, the redesign that he has for our lives. When we come to the Savior, he shows us our sin. He shows us what needs to go. And then we rely on him to continue to work to move that. One prayer we might pray, Lord, show me what needs to go and help me give it to you. It reminded me when I read that story in her conclusion that uh, back in my uh, basketball days, I had a wonderful coach who was a good Christian man. And I remember one year we started out the season and we'd only gotten in a couple of practices, but there was one young man on my team who Every day, amidst our scrimmages and practices, uh, used uh, loudly foul language. Foul language. And he had a foul attitude to match. And so after about two practices, and this had gone on as we played in this, our third practice, the coach brought us all over, and he uh, called the young man out right there in front of us. He said his name, but he said, Son, you belong on this team, and I want you to be a part of this team. But your mouth does not belong here. He said, from, so from now on, I want you to check your mouth at the door before you walk into the gym. And we'll move forward like that. What do you say? Well, not that he had much choice, right? But it straightened it out. I don't know everything that I need to check. But I know there's things I need to check at the door. Jesus Christ. Maybe it's my mouth I need to give to him. Maybe it's my attitude. Maybe it is a burden that I've carried for too long. Maybe, maybe it's an attitude of bias toward a group of people. Maybe it's bitterness that I'd long allowed to take root in my heart. Whatever it is, God says, Ken, you need to check that with my son Jesus Christ. In other words, give it to him. Leave it there. Let me remove that from your life. And when we pray that prayer and we invite him to do that, friends, he promises to. In the Christian story, we sometimes call that repentance. But in Ezekiel's case, he's removing that heart of stone in order to turn us around and continue his work of making us new. The first step's removing what needs to go. Secondly, replacement. He takes out the old and replaces with the new. Did you see that in the scripture passage? I will put, I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. So God continues his work of making all things new by not just removing the old, but by replacing it with his new. I had a good friend in Morgantown when I served at Wesley United Methodist Church. His name was Russell. Russell waited for many, many months for a heart transplant because he had complete heart failure. It took a long time. I remember visiting him in Pittsburgh while he was waiting. And then I remember being with his family as he received his new heart. When the word came, we have a match. 
and the heart transplant was successful. Now he underwent after that, as many of you would be aware, after the transplant he went through a a long series of anti-rejection therapy, allowing his body time to adapt and accept his new heart and not reject it. But I can still see him the first Sunday that he was back in worship there after he had recovered. He gave me a big hug and he said, I'm here and my new heart's here. And what a joy it was to share in those moments with him. But you see, it wasn't an easy journey for my friend Russell because a heart transplant is serious, serious business. And it's a long journey and a continual journey because sometimes your body wants to reject what has been made new. You understand that spiritually, friends. As God replaces within us and places within us a new heart, it's still not easy. Sometimes we want to revert back to old patterns. Sometimes it's easy to hang on to those old attitudes and want to return to it. We reject sometimes the change that Jesus is trying to make in our hearts and in our lives. But friends, if you continue to allow him to work his work, he has never failed one person on this planet. When we continue to allow him to work his work, he has never failed. Again, it can be a challenging journey. Maybe a prayer you would pray would be, God, work your work in me and replace the old with the new. Work your work in me and replace the old with the new. He promises to do that for us when we open ourselves to living for Jesus Christ. Betty Paulus tells the story of her son. She said even growing up, he he lived in Seattle at the time, but she said even growing up, if he would have only had a one outfit, it probably would have ended up on the floor somewhere. That's how messy he was. Couldn't keep his room straight, and she said once he moved out on his own and had that apartment in Seattle, he couldn't keep it straight. Every time she visited, she was appalled at just how messy his place was. Then she talks about her son getting married. She says the first time she visited his apartment about a month or so after he had gotten married and his bride had moved in with him into that apartment. She said she walked in and everything was in order. Everything was in its place. And she said, I looked at my son and said, someone else must be living here. Someone else must be living here. Wouldn't it be wonderful in our church, that the radical love people encounter is so much different than what you encounter in the world. And when they walked in to Bridgeport United Methodist Church, they would say, someone else must live here. This is a place where the living Lord Jesus Christ abides. This is different than what we encounter in the world. I feel like my life can be aligned with God in Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it be wonderful if when you lived your life and begin to live your life for Jesus Christ, that you could testify to someone and say, yes, that was the old Ken. But for the new man, the new person, someone else lives here. I testify before you today because you need to know that on my own, I cannot deal with my sin. On my own, I cannot deal with my failure. On my own, I cannot bear the burdens of life and the brokenness that I encounter. On my own, I cannot fathom making all of the decisions that you need to make along the life journey. But praise God, today, I am not alone. Someone else lives here. And friend, you are not alone. Because someone abides in your heart and life that loves you and will strengthen you in ways that you never thought possible. That's what happens when God replaces the old with the new. Transformation occurs, which leads me to my final one from Ezekiel, revival. God removes the old heart, places new heart within us transforms us, and then we are revived. Did you see that in Ezekiel 28? Then you shall live, 
in the land that I gave to your ancestors. And you shall be my people and I will be your God. Then you shall live. To be revived means to come back to life again. To discover what authentic and genuine life is. That is God's desire for you. And it happens when we open ourselves individually and as the congregation to Jesus Christ and his work in our lives. New life. It's time to live the new life that we have been given through our actions and through our attitudes. Had a pastor friend a number of years ago. We went to college and seminary together. But my friend struggled, he struggled severely with his weight all, most all of his life. But in his first appointment out of seminary, he was a part of the Virginia Conference, he had a doctor there in his small church who really took an interest in him. And so he got with him and got him on a program and started monitoring him and helping him just on his own. Would go alongside him on walks and various things that he had him do. Encouraged him with his diet. My friend lost some 150 pounds. Better health, better able to mobilize. Now he's told this story many times through the years, and I remember when I heard him tell it the first time, I asked him if I could use it, which I have used it before. But he said one of the things the doctor kept saying to him is, because he would say to his friend, I feel like a new person. I feel like a new person. And his doctor friend would say to him, well, if you're a new person, you have to walk like a new person. In other words, you have to live differently. And in fact, quite physically, my friend had to learn to walk differently. Because by his own testimony, because of the severe struggle that he had with his weight and the amount of weight, he actually had more of a shuffle when he walked rather than a regular stride. So part of what his friend had to do for him is show him how to stand upright and have a regular stride as he, as he walked. But he said he kept saying to me, if you're a new person, you have to walk like a new person. And friends, that's exactly who we're called to be. This is us. If we've allowed God to come into our hearts, to warm our hearts, to redesign the inner space, you're a new person. Walk like a new person. People all around us are discovering what it means to come back to life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, through our recovery ministries and, and celebrate recovery. People are dealing with their hearts and their habits and their hang-ups in a way that's causing them to experience new life in a wonderful way. People in our own congregation here, giving their life to Christ Jesus, finding out what genuine life and joy really are about. Every day in our midst, we have people who have made new commitments to faith and to service. And through that commitment to faith and service, have discovered what it means to be revived, to come to life again. Friends, I pray today that we would open ourselves individually and open ourselves as a church always to the transforming work of Jesus Christ who's able to redesign that inner space by removing the old, replacing it with the new, and showing us how to live fully for him. Brothers and sisters, I pray today that all of us would see our need to know our need for the Savior in our lives. And then to trust the one who is able to meet that need in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, continually you have held out your invitation to your people. From the days of the prophet Ezekiel to the fullness of time and the coming of your son Jesus. Through the ministry and proclamation of the early apostles and the founders of the church, the message has rung true. Open us again, O oh God, to your word and to your message, that our hearts might be open to you, that you might work your work in us and cause us to live faithfully and joyfully for you. 